This video will demonstrate anatomic femoral and tibial tunnel placement during anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction with the use of hybrid hamstring autograft and semitendinosus allograft. Disclosures for all the authors are listed here. Preoperative x-rays and an MRI are shown here. The anterior cruciate ligament tear can be seen clearly on the coronal and sagittal MRI images. Pathognomonic ACL tear bone bruises are seen on these MRI T2 images. The bone bruises are seen in the middle one-third of the lateral femoral condyle, also known as the sulcus terminalis and the posterolateral lateral tibia. Anatomic femoral and tibial tunnel placement. Good visualization of the back wall is important in achieving anatomic femoral tunnel placement. For all inside femoral tunnel drilling, an accessory far medial portal is created. It is important to create this portal under direct arthroscopic visualization with the aid of a spinal needle. This will ensure that the portal is medial and low just above the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, avoiding iatrogenic injury to the medial meniscus. It's also crucial to ensure that the drill is perpendicular to the wall in order to create a round as opposed to an oval tunnel. A 45 degree microfracturol is placed through the far medial accessory portal to create a starting point for the femoral tunnel. A good view of the starting point is ideal for anatomic femoral tunnel placement. Good visualization allows for an accurate perspective of femoral tunnel positioning. Alternatively, a femoral guide can also be used to create a starting point for an anatomic femoral tunnel. Here the guide is placed directly on the back wall and a guide pin is drilled. If a small portion of the native anatomic ACL footprint is preserved after notchplasty work, a femoral guide can be placed directly over it for outside in drilling. In this clip, a femoral guide is used for anatomic outside in femoral tunnel drilling. Arthroscopic visualization shows good positioning of the guide pin within the native anatomic ACL femoral footprint. A pituitary device can be used to hold the guide pin in place during outside end femoral tunnel reaming. An accurate perspective of the femoral tunnel created is seen here. An adequate back wall is clearly visualized. A 360 view shows the anatomic femoral tunnel created using an outside-in technique. An adequate 2 millimeters of back wall is clearly seen. The various techniques shown in this slide can all be used to achieve an anatomic femoral tunnel within the native anatomic ACL footprint. Good arthroscopic visualization and a probe outline the ACL tibial footprint. A Trucker gauge is shown here to demonstrate the length of the ACL tibial footprint. Similarly, here the width of the ACL tibial footprint is measured. The tibial tunnel locations for anatomic single bundle and double bundle techniques are shown in this slide. The anatomic tibial ACL footprint is in line with the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus and adjacent to the medial articular cartilage. As the native ACL tibial footprint is preserved, a tibial guide can be placed in the center in order to achieve an anatomic tibial tunnel. A guide pin is placed in the center of the ACL tibial footprint using this tibial guide. Leaving a remnant tibial footprint allows for an accurate representation of the native ACL tibial attachment and also preserves proprioceptive fibers. When reaming the tibial tunnel, it is helpful to dock the guide pin into the femur to avoid any unwanted movement. This clip shows the ream tibial tunnel to be in the center of the native ACL tibial footprint. 
Note the location of the anatomic tibial tunnel created in line with the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus and adjacent to the medial articular cartilage. This slide shows the ACL tibial footprint using a tibial guide. It is important to understand the anatomic landmarks and the placement of the tibial tunnel within the center of the native footprint. A broad arthroscopic view of anatomic femoral and tibial tunnels is seen in both of these pictures. Hybrid hamstring autograft with semitendinosus allograft preparation. Both the harvested gracilis and semitendinosus tendons, as well as the semitendinosus allograft, are whip stitched at both ends using non absorbable suture. All tendons are then placed through a loop starting with the semitendinosus allograft, allowing the autografts to be on the outside and the allograft in the middle. The end goal is to leave as little of the allograft tissue exposed to the knee joint milieu in vivo. Allograft tissue was provided by LifeNet Health and all grafts were sterilized using the Alawash XG process, including 1.2 to 1.9 mega rads of irradiation. A cortical suspension device was added to the looped end while the free ends were pulled to tension using a graft tensioning device. Beginning at the looped end of the graft, a braided suture is used to bundle the tendons together. The suture is started between the grafts in the middle so as to place the knot in the middle at the end. The braided suture is run down towards the non-looped end of the graft stopping several centimeters from the tendon ends allowing the ends to be separated later for backup tibial fixation using a large frag bicortical metal screw with washer. The braided suture is then run back up the opposite side of the graft, ensuring to incorporate all tenons. Once the suture is run back up to the looped end, a knot is tied and buried in the middle of the graft so as to avoid any irritation from the suture knot. The graft is soaked in mineral oil under tension until ready for insertion into the knee, with the mineral oil acting as a lubricant to help pass the graft. Final arthroscopic pictures after passing the graft show good placement of the graft within the native anatomic ACL footprints. Postoperative imaging shows anatomic placement of the femoral and tibial tunnels. For femoral fixation, a cortical suspensory device was used. On the tibial side, an interference screw was used for primary fixation and backup fixation was achieved using a bicortical large frag metal screw with a washer. The authors believe that we can define an anatomic anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction as placing 100% of the tunnels within the native ACL attachment footprints on the tibia and the femur. These images show the appropriate anatomic placement of the femoral and tibial tunnels using hamstring as well as patellar tendon grafts. Anatomic ACL reconstruction accurately reproduces native knee kinematics. It also allows for knee stability both in the sagittal plane and rotationally. Tunnel malposition is the most common technical error in ACL reconstruction leading to failure. An anterior femoral tunnel is the most common type of malposition. Anatomic placement of the graft and femoral and tibial tunnels is perhaps the most important factor for a successful ACL reconstruction. Anatomic ACL reconstruction involves an anatomic placement of the femoral and tibial tunnels. The center of the ACL femoral footprint is located in an average of 43% of the proximal to distal distance 
of the lateral femoral notch centered over the lateral bifurcate ridge. No native fibers are located anterior to the lateral intercondylar ridge or residence ridge and the distance between the posterior edge of the footprint and the posterior articular cartilage is approximately 2.5 millimeters. The center of the tibial footprint has been described as even with the posterior edge of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus in the anterior to posterior direction, 15 millimeters anterior to the posterior cruciate ligament, and 40% of the medial to lateral interspinous distance. An anatomic ACL system can be used in a variety of ACL reconstruction techniques including single bundle, double bundle, medial portal, and outside-in ACL reconstruction. The authors recommend using outside-in ACL reconstruction in the revision setting for patients with a large leg, for skeletally immature patients, and in patients with a long patellar tendon to avoid graft tunnel mismatch. Medial portal and outside in drilling during ACL reconstruction allow for 100% of the tunnels to be within the native ACL footprint. They also allow for independent tibial tunnel placement, for the aperture size to be the same as the drill size, and for the femoral tunnel to be drilled within virgin femoral bone. Our post-operative rehabilitation protocol involves initially reducing pain and swelling using cryotherapy. The patient will ambulate with the brace locked in extension for four weeks weight-bearing as tolerated and using crutches until they can walk without a limp. Immediate motion and early weight-bearing as well as immediate muscle exercises involving the quadriceps are encouraged. Closed kinetic chain exercises are performed with the physical therapist. The brace is shortened and unlocked at four weeks post-operatively and the patient is transitioned to a hinged knee sleeve at two months. The goal is for the patient to perform early functional activities, fostering an earlier return to sports and more aggressive rehabilitation. A safe return to sports and competition can be expected at seven to nine months post-operatively and is managed on a case-by-case -case basis. With respect to outcomes, 42 patients received this hybrid hamstring autograft with semitendinosus allograft. The average graft diameter was 9.9 millimeters compared to 7.8 millimeters in the isolated autograft group. Graft failure rate was only 5 out of 42 patients. This autograft anatomic ACL reconstruction technique in young patients less than 25 years old shows far superior results to the allograft group with respect to revision rate and reoperation, patient reported outcome scores, and ultimately return to sport. The advantages of increased graft diameter are an increased tensile strength and decreased anterior laxity and a decreased articular cartilage contact stress. Graft diameters less than 8.5 millimeters have been associated with a greater risk of graft failure and inferior patient reported outcome scores. A hybrid graft allows us to increase graft diameter. In our cohort of patients, it also showed a decreased revision rate, 11.9 versus 28.3 percent compared to the standard hamstring autograft group. It also showed a much lower failure rate in our high-risk younger patients less than 18 years of age who are more prone to graft failure. Thank you.